I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, Engaging Diverse Learners in a Virtual School Setting. This session is being recorded and the archive will be available within 24 hours. If you registered through Extension's free events website, you will automatically receive an email with a link to this recording. If for some reason you do not receive the email tomorrow, and I should be sending it out um, early tomorrow morning or early afternoon, you can access the archive manually by going to uci.webex.com, clicking on the Event Center tab, and then clicking on View Event Recordings. This presentation will be listed with other recordings, so you would simply need to search for this webinar's title. My name is Lisa Kotowaki, and I'm a Program Manager here at UC Irvine Extension. Here's a brief outline of what we are going to cover in this webinar session. First, I'll start off with a quick overview of WebEx features, so you'll know how to submit questions throughout the presentation. Next, I'll be giving you some information about virtual teacher resources offered by both UC Irvine Extension and Coursera. I will then turn it over to our guest speaker, Paromita Das, who will be sharing strategies to engage and motivate students in a virtual setting. At the end of her presentation, we will have a brief Q&A session. And finally, I'll leave you with my contact information so that you can send us any additional questions that we didn't address. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar today, please send a chat message over to UCI Robert, and he will help you troubleshoot any issues. If you have a question for Paramita regarding the content of this presentation, please submit it in the chat panel and we will address it at the, at the end of the webinar if we have time. So if you look at the right-hand corner of your screen, if you're on a PC, if you're on a Mac, it may appear in the lower right-hand corner. You should see a row of icons. Go ahead and click on the chat bubble icon and the chat panel should show up on your screen. Feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation. Um, our guest speaker may also be asking you some questions uh, during her portion of the presentation where she'll be asking you to engage and participate. So you can also submit your answers to any questions that she poses to you in that chat panel. And you'll want to make sure that you do send your questions in the drop down under the send to. Make sure you send it to the host, presenter, and panelists, and that'll ensure that both myself and the guest presenter um, receive your questions or receive your answers uh, to any poll type questions. All right, in regard to the virtual teacher resources, here are three pathways offered by UC Irvine Extension and Coursera for those of you interested in furthering your knowledge and skills in this field. The first pathway includes free MOOCs or massive open online courses on Coursera. The second pathway is the virtual teacher specialization track on Coursera. And the third track is the virtual teacher series on Coursera, plus a capstone practicum course offered by UC Irvine Extension. So I'll be covering each pathway briefly. OK, so the first pathway includes the free MOOCs on Coursera. Currently, we offer four virtual teacher MOOCs on Coursera that you can sign up for at no cost. The topics include Foundations of Virtual Instruction, Emerging Trends and te Technologies, Advanced Instructional Strategies, and Performance Assessment. Each MOOC lasts five weeks and consists of weekly lecture videos, quizzes, an assignment, and a final exam. And if you're interested in learning more about the virtual teacher MOOCs that we offer or any MOOCs that um, UC Irvine has on Coursera, you can visit the link listed here on this slide. The fourth MOOC, which is Performance Assessment, actually started this past Monday, but you can still sign up today if you're interested in joining. If you prefer to wait and take this series of MOOCs in order, um, we will be offering them sequentially starting with the first one, Foundations of Virtual Instruction, in June 2014. But if you want to get started right away, um, this is the fourth and final MOOC of the series. However, you can join the series at any time. So the Performance Assessment MOOC is currently open and is in the first week.
going back to the pathways, the second pathway is the virtual teacher spe specialization on Coursera. Coursera. So earlier this year, Coursera launched its specialization initiative, and we're very excited to have our virtual teacher MOOCs as part of this new offering. The virtual teacher specialization includes the series of the four previously mentioned virtual teacher MOOCs with a concluding capstone project. If you're interested in earning this specialization certificate, you must enroll in each MOOC via signature track, which verifies your ident identity at $39 per course plus the capstone project at the end of the series, which is $49. Finally, the last pathway is the virtual teacher series on Coursera with UC Irvine Extension's fully online practicum course at the end. And on this slide, you'll see a screenshot and a URL if you're interested in learning more about this option in much more detail. For this pathway, individuals would, would need to sign up for all four Coursera virtual teacher MOOCs listed in the box in the lower right-hand corner via signature track and receive a 90% or higher in each MOOC. These prerequisites must be met before enrolling in our practicum course. Here's a bit more information about the practicum. It is offered online through UC Irvine Extension, not Coursera, and it costs $600. The course fee does not include textbooks, which the course may require. The practicum is a great opportunity for students to receive indiv individualized instruction, as well as university credit for completion of the coursework. The units will appear on an official transcript that may be submitted to your school district as requirements for professional development or salary advancement. At the end of the practicum, students will have a course development prototype to add to their portfolio that could serve as the basis for actual implementation with staff and students. Now, unlike the MOOCs on Coursera that have, may have thousands of enrollments, our practicum will have a much smaller student to instructor ratio. With this smaller class size, you can expect more personalized feedback from the instructor and other students enrolled in the course. The online course will also be much more structured with weekly discussion forums, evaluated learning assessments, and weekly deadlines. Certificates of completion will be issued to those students who earn a letter grade of a C or better in the practicum. In summer 2014, we will be launching the virtual teacher practicum for those students who have completed the four prerequisite MOOCs. The start and end dates of the practicum are listed on this slide, as well as the online course fee of $600. Registration will open on May 2nd, and students may enroll either online or by calling our Student Services Office. Now, as a reminder, this offering is only available to those students who have met and successfully completed the prerequisites. For those of you who plan on pursuing this option but have yet to complete the MOOCs, we do plan on offering the practicum twice a year, so there will be more opportunities in the future. This slide has my contact information as well as my directors, so if you have any questions about any of the resources that I mentioned, please feel free to contact us or visit our website for more information. Okay, at this time I'd like to hand the presenter ball over to our um, guest speaker, Paromita, so that she can introduce herself and begin her portion of the presentation. So let me go ahead and hand that presenter ball over to her. Paromita, can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Thank you. All right, perfect. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining in today for today's webinar on engaging diverse learners in a virtual school setting. I hope you found this webinar informative, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you have. Here's a little bit of background information about me. I have taught at the traditional school setting um, for two and a half years. I've taught high school biology and natural science too. Currently I'm teaching seventh grade life science at a virtual school. I do have a master's of arts in teaching from UC Irvine and I also have a teaching credential in single subject science. 
This is just a brief breakdown of what I will be discussing today. I'm going to start off with an introduction and then discuss components of a virtual classroom session um, and also talk about tools and strategies used for assessing students in a virtual school setting and also about engaging with students outside the virtual school setting. I'm going to wrap up with a summary and then a short Q&A session for any questions that you have. Before I begin, I wanted to ask uh, the audience a few questions. I'm curious about who's attending today. Um, so please feel free to use the chat panel to answer some of the questions above. Um, first one is, how many years of experience do you have teaching, if it's applicable? In what settings have you taught? And in what ways do you use technology in the classroom? So I'll go ahead and give you a few minutes to answer those questions. Okay, I see some um, answers coming in. Thank you, Cindy. Um, it says three years of virtual webinars. That's fantastic. And again, for any of those, any of you who are wondering how to submit your responses, you'll want to go ahead and submit them in the chat panel, making sure that you do send them to the host, presenter, and panelists, and that will ensure that it comes to us. Okay, well, feel free to um, go ahead and um, respond to that on your own time if you would like, but thank you for sharing your responses. I'm going to go ahead and continue. Before I begin, I wanted to go over some misconceptions about a virtual school. A lot of the time, uh, my family or friends, they'll, they'll say, how do you teach online, or is that even possible? Um, common misconceptions include that everything's done on the computer and online in a virtual school. Um, that virtual schools are the same as homeschooling except on a computer, and that teachers at a virtual school don't actually teach. And actually, before I started teaching at a virtual school, I thought very much the same thing. However, um, after teaching in this kind of setting, you realize that a lot of it is actually very similar to a traditional school setting. Um, everything's aligned to the standards. All the teachers are credentialed. And there's a lot more that happens outside the computer than in the online setting than we realize. And, Hopefully that will clarify some misconceptions that any of you have as we go along um, in today's webinar. So what kind of students are in a virtual school? I have a diverse background of students that attend virtual school. I have actually over 200 students. Um, several of them are English language learners, um, students with IEP and 504 plans. A lot of my students, sadly, have been severely bullied in the past, and hence they don't want to attend a, the traditional school setting. Um, they're students with disabilities. I also have students who are famous actors or musicians. I will look them up sometimes <laughs> on YouTube. Um, students who are athletes. I've had students who are homeless, and 30% of my students are from low SES or socioeconomic status in broken homes. A lot of them are farm eligible. And um, I also have students who are partially deaf or have speech impairments, and students from all backgrounds attend the virtual school. And in addition, um, the virtual school where I teach, uh, students come from all counties in Southern California, so that includes San Diego, Los Angeles, Orange County, San Bernardino, so several students actually attend. So um, this is kind of what the virtual classroom looks like. Um, it's kind of like a webinar setting, you can say, that I, where I can post um, a PowerPoint slide. And uh, there's usually a chat panel and attendees pod on the right. However, due to confidentiality purposes, I did not display that here. Um, the wall displays also include the topic of the day, the next generation science standards, Esslers, web links and files, again, the chat pod, and then class rules. And then I'm going to discuss what, are, what other technological resources I do use in the virtual classroom as we go along. What kind of supports are available? In the virtual classroom, the following are available to students. Usually there's a note-taking guide and graphic organizer, which, is, um, which they are able to upload um, through the virtual classroom. There's interactive files, review games, and video with closed captioning. 
Some examples of supports are something that you would use in a traditional classroom setting, um, graphic organizers, um, note-taking guides, note cards, and then it's, in this example I have students match the vocabulary word with the picture below. So what kind of technology is used during live virtual classroom sessions? The use of interactive files and video clips from sources such as Discovery Education has helped students better understand abstract concepts and more complex ideas. I realized also um, by teaching middle school science that several of my students have benefited when I've discussed processes or concepts such as pedigrees or genetics or photosynthesis, concepts that they have a little bit of difficulty understanding. Based on my own experience and also on interviews conducted with colleagues at the school, teachers who use interactive files during their virtual classroom sessions or have students use them in the virtual classroom stated that students enjoy the interactive file or better understood concepts. I've also noticed in my class that uh, retention has been improved in most students and that they've done a lot better on their test after the use of interactive files. This is an example of an interactive file that I've used. I hope that you're able to see that okay. Um, during the virtual classroom session, maybe after introducing a concept um, or at the end of a session, I'll go ahead and pull up an interactive file. Due to the fact that I have so many English language learners and students with specific needs, um, I try and enhance their vocabulary. So in this example, I talked about the parts of a flower or angiosperms and the components of pollination. And what students do is they drag the labels, and they can do this individually, which is nice because they get to learn at their own pace. They drag the labels below to the empty boxes on the diagram. And then the correct answers are shown in green, and the incorrect answers are shown in red. So if they get an answer wrong, they can go ahead and change that. And then what happens is, as a class, we go ahead and discuss the answers. And if they got it incorrect, um, we discuss why and where it should go. So it's really an effective tool. So what are the benefits of using interactive files? The use of new technological tools such as simulations allow teachers to customize and individualize instruction. Teachers can personalize learning and teaching to specific learning styles with the use of interactive files. The, the nice thing about interactive files is that it embeds audio, video, and visual cues. So students with multiple learning styles find their comprehension of concepts increases through simultaneously reading, listening, and watching, especially for complex processes or concepts presented. Here's another example of an interactive file. This is something that I used when talking about ecosystems in my class, and students had to identify the biotic components and the abiotic components of the ecosystem. Audio was embedded in this interactive file, and they could also read through the interactive file and take a self-assessment quiz at the end. There's also a way that I assess students during the live virtual class. Methods of assessing student learning during virtual classroom sessions include discussion questions, poll pod questions, the randomizer, and breakout rooms. And I'm going to show you um, what each of those look like as we go along. The benefits of assessments during live virtual class allow students to answer higher order questions. It motivates students to use their microphones to answer questions so that students are able to use their headset and actually speak their answer or answer discussion question if they would like to. Um, and also, it helps to increase motivation and allow for active participation during the virtual classroom lesson. Here are some examples of poll pods that I use. Often when students are entering the virtual classroom, I'll have a poll pod um, that I'll use as a warm-up question. I can use a multiple choice type of question or I can go ahead and have students answer a short answer question. So here are some examples. You can see what does carrying capacity mean. I have some answers coming in about that. And students can broadcast results so everyone can see their answers. Um, and then the one on the right, I just asked a generic question, how are you feeling about your upcoming test? And then I can see which percentage of students are scared or calm. And I can do this with content-based questions, or I can do it with generic questions such as what are you doing for spring break. So it's a really nice and effective tool. 
The use of poll pod questions in the virtual classroom where students could answer multiple choice and short answer questions using Bloom's taxonomy has helped with the assessment of students' prior knowledge. I also can use it as an exit ticket. Oftentimes I do that, um, usually use, using the short answer poll pod. In addition, teachers can go back and see what percentage of the class answered the questions correctly and which students did not participate. In this case, if there's a concept that I need to revisit and reteach the class, I can go ahead and do that as well. This is another tool that I really like using. It's called a randomizer. This tool randomly selects a student to participate from the attendees pod in the virtual classroom. So if I'm playing a review game with them, such as Jeopardy, I can go ahead and use that randomizer to call in a student to answer the question. Also, if I am going over a discussion question with the class, I can go ahead and click on someone um, to participate and answer that question. So they get really excited about participating and, and a little nervous about who's going to be called on. Breakout rooms is another tool I really like to use. I know that's hard to see, but I have another slide that shows a better picture. Um, in a breakout room, say there's 30 attendees in the meeting, I can click on a breakout room and then the one room is divided into five separate rooms where there's about five to six students who can discuss a particular question that I've posed in their breakout room. So here's a better example. Um, it says describe how changes in an ecosystem can affect the organisms that live there. And then they can pick one note taker and one speaker for the group. They have about five minutes to discuss. There's a, it's hard to see a little bit, but there's a chat pod where they can discuss. Someone can take notes and then they can use their microphone rights to answer the questions as a group. And then in five minutes I bring them back into the main room where we have a large group discussion about the questions that I had posted. So this really motivates students to participate and it's a nice tool because in a virtual school setting, students really need that social interaction and so they, they really enjoy having that time to um, work with each other and come up with their own ideas about a certain topic. How breakout rooms benefit students? It increases student participation and collaboration. It also encourages students to share their perspectives on certain issues. I've noticed it does build confidence in several students who are initially shy about speaking out in class. And it does allow students with different skill sets to work together. So how do I assess students outside of virtual class? Usually this is done through discussion threads, projects, and portfolios, which I will discuss. Discussion threads allow students to converse about scientific topics that are meaningful to students. They allow students to build a community of thought around an engaging question or theory. Students can also comment on each other's posts and also give positive feedback to one another. So usually there's a question that's posed such as what are the effects of global warming um, on the environment and then um, students will respond to that question and then other students can go in and reply to their responses. Portfolios and projects are a huge um, assessment that is used in the virtual school setting and I'm going to go over some examples of those as we go along. These are some just, um, just little snapshots of what some of my students have done this year. The significance of portfolios and projects are that they help con students connect what they are learning in the classroom to authentic real life situations. I also have students in my gifted and talented science working on a project based semester long project where they get involved with people in the community and work on creating a project where they can help the environment in their local hometown. And actually one of my students was recognized by a local newspaper for his um, actions in cleaning up the desert community where he lives. Some more examples of some projects that my gifted and talented students have done. Uh, another one of my students had um, encouraged and persuaded his family to replace some of their appliances for more eco-friendly appliances. And then he collected data on the monthly savings that they made as a result of that. Portfolios um, in science are pretty much similar to 
standard labs in a traditional school setting. The nice thing about portfolios in a virtual school setting are that if students don't have the resources to conduct the lab um, using plants or other hands-on materials, they have the option of doing the virtual lab modification. So the, this is just a screenshot of a virtual lab that I used this past semester where students would observe the effects of the type of soil, the amount of sunlight and water on tomato plants. Students who had the available resources could go ahead and do this in real life, so they would go out and buy three plants and then see the plant growth or observe the plant growth that occurred in a four-day period. How to engage with students outside of the virtual setting. Uh, the way that teachers engage with students um, outside of that virtual classroom is to make constant phone calls. We're on the phone quite a lot, face-to-face uh, -face contact, and also field trips. Regular communication is of utmost importance at this school. All teachers are responsible for making phone calls to students and their families over a certain amount of time. Most of the time, um, I talk to a student maybe twice a month minimum. A lot of the times, they call me. And I'm also speaking to their family at that time. Um, the call can range from about 30 minutes to an hour. Sometimes it can be less if it's a qu quick question that they have. During these calls, teachers assess student learning. So a lot of the time, if we really need to know if they're understanding concepts, we'll go ahead and just ask them questions without letting them know ahead of time. Um, we also provide study strategies and tips for success for students that are falling behind. And we also talk to families about ways to help the student achieve their goals. Teachers build rapport with students at this time, work hand in hand with the learning coach and caretaker of the family. Oftentimes that can be a parent or an uncle or somebody else, um, such as a coach. And together we come up with a systemized approach to better enhance learning and also strategize about ways to schedule their time when they're going through the course. So the nice thing about virtual school is that students can have a, they do have a personalized learning plan where they do a certain amount of lessons um, per day that is flexible with the kind of schedule that they have. Face-to-face -face contact is something that occurs frequently as well at a virtual school setting. A lot of the time this is done during field trips, beginning of the year and middle of the year picnics, and during state testing, which is coming up um, starting next week. Several of us are going to be going to different testing sites and testing students in different locations. Field trips are also a big thing. The nice thing about this virtual school is that field trips happen. I mean, I think last semester we had about 40 or 50 field trips. So um, I also organized one of them. These are just some small snapshots of the field trip. It was at Chino Creek Wetlands, an educational park. And students were learning about water conservation and water cycle in my class. And they were able to apply several of the uh, resources that they saw at the field trip to what they were learning in the class. So in summary, virtual schooling is more than reading off a computer. Teachers in a virtual school have a diverse student population in their classes, and a variety of tools and assessments are utilized for enhancing comprehension and measuring students' understanding. So hopefully this clarified several of the misconceptions that I discussed at the beginning. Um, and there's a lot more that goes into virtual school setting. Um, I've just started teaching there last year, and so there are several other resources, such as the use of applets and other technological de devices that I'm still continuing to learn about. So it's an ongoing process, and every day I learn something or the other from my colleagues. All right, perfect. Thank you so much, Paramita. And if any of you have any questions, um, please do feel free to submit them in the chat panel. And I, I wanted to ask you, um, for any new teachers to the virtual school setting, or even if there's teachers logged in that teach in a, like a blended or hybrid environment, what are some things that you could recommend or suggest for them, things that you may not have known when you first became an online instructor or teacher, but that you wish you would have known in order to boost uh, student engagement? 
whether it be, I don't know if there's any tools that you have suggestions for, or just methods or teaching strategies that you can share. Sure. I think um, a lot of what I learned at the virtual school um, happened through the collaboration with my colleagues coming in. Um, they had trained us for about two weeks where we read up on all these different technological devices, and it was all very abstract. I think um, once I started actually working with those tools and it was more hands-on and kind of observing my colleagues and what they do, um, I was able to learn more. And nowadays, I kind of want to learn more on my own as well, you know, something as simple as making a website, um, researching on applets. They're all, they're all very useful. Um, when I was in a traditional school setting, I learned a lot from one of the science teachers who used Quizdom. I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, um, but that's where they kind of have like a little bit of a small remote type of thing where they're able to answer questions um, using that remote in the form of a game. So um, even before teaching at a virtual school, I tried to enhance um, you know, my learning with certain technologies just so I realized that it's such a big thing now um, in the public traditional school that, and it's becoming more and more advanced. So I'm trying. My my suggestion would be just to try and and be updated with, you know, some of the new things that are that are coming up. Because whether you teach at a virtual school or not, um, it, it's just a a very helpful resource. And um, I've noticed that my students, when they see that I know about certain technology or that I use certain technology, they become really excited about um, using that in the class. And, and they also, I think, see me differently as, you know, okay, she knows what she's talking about. So um, I guess staying up to date would be my best recommendation. And I continue to attend professional development whenever I can, um, and I've learned a lot from that as well. Um, so whenever there's an opportunity that arises where teachers are talking about technology or anything else in the classroom, I, I go ahead and grab that opportunity because I've seen that it's really helped me. Great. And then I think there was a question that popped up in the chat panel. Okay, the question is um, what the difference is between a virtual school and WebEx. So if you want to take a shot at, at that question um, so that we can help the attendee understand a little bit about the differences. Sure. Um, so it's different from um, WebEx because in WebEx um, you're able to see, you know, PowerPoint, there's a chat and a participants list, and that's very similar to what a virtual classroom looks like. But um, I'm able to pull in a lot of tools such as the breakout rooms. I'm able to... Um, show video um, and also interactive files. Students can use their microphone rights to answer questions. Um, I could even enable video if I wanted to, which I believe it can be done in the WebEx as well, but um, the use of poll pods and things like that um, are things that can be used. And um, in general, it's just you can make it very interactive. Um, you know, there's other teachers that have pulled up games in there. Um, and use certain applets in there. So um, it's similar in some sense, but I think there's a lot more interaction or interactive tools that can be used. Okay, and I'm seeing one more question from another attendee, and it, looked like, it looks like it just came to me. So uh, for the interactive files, when you covered that in your presentation, what was the software used to create those interactive files? Was it something provided by the virtual school that you teach for, or is that something that somebody can go find and utilize on their own? Thank you. That's a good question. Um, there are interactive files that are embedded within the lessons at the virtual school. Um, a lot of them use BrainPop or other um, Pearson types of um, interactive files. However, I also go in and look for interactive files, and the way I do that is I just go to Google and I type in a concept such as photosynthesis, and I need to type in SWF file because that's the only file that will allow me to show that interactive file in the um, virtual classroom. However, yeah, just going into Google and, and putting in a concept in SWF will show several interactive files that are available for public use. Okay. All 
All right. I don't know if you want to scroll through your chat panel, see if there's any other questions. Let me go ahead and move on to the next slide. So if you think of a question after the webinar is over and you want to submit them to us, um, my email address is listed here on this slide. So please do feel free to email me with any questions or comments, and I can go ahead and forward them on to um, Paramita. And Paramita, thank you so much for all of the information that you've shared with us. Again, if you do have any questions following up to the end of this webinar, please feel free to email them to us. And hopefully you all enjoy the webinar and gain some insight into strategies used to enhance student engagement and motivation. Thank you so much and have a great day, everybody. Thank you.